Check Podcasts. Hey everyone, and welcome to Political Capital, your source for all the latest in BC politics. I'm your host, Rob Shaw, coming to you from the Czech News World Headquarters here in Victoria, where we are going to talk about all sorts of merger speculation surrounding the BC Conservatives and BC United, plus new modeling the NDP government says proves that their housing laws will drive down prices. To do that, we are going to bring in the pod squad. You know and love them each and every week. Ali Blades, Jillian Oliver, and Jeff Ferrier, thank you for being here again this week. Let us give you the topic of housing for Christmas to start with. We are going to talk again about it. We've been talking about it basically for weeks now because it's such a dominant part uh, of BC politics right now. But when the government passed five major housing bills in the legislature last week, it said it was going to come up with the details and the modeling for that in the future. Well, it turns out the future, seven days later, those modeling <laughs> The numbers and details drop, and here we are trying to figure out what they mean. The big takeaway, I think, for most of the public is going to be that the modeling indicates that the government's changes to put multiplexes on single-family lots and condo towers at transit hubs could drop prices 6 to 12 percent, sort of, not really, like not quite actual drops, but less than it might have gone up or something like that. Ali, um, start with you. Is it believable? Is it usable politically? Uh, what do you what do you make of that uh, interesting modeling report there? Is it usable politically? Absolutely. I mean, this is it looks like a very positive, good story for the NDP uh, on a communications level. Everything's going in the right direction of like, look what we've done. We did so much. Like I've said in the past, like it's been headline after headline of all of these housing announcements, which is exactly what they aim to do in the first place. Um, and now we have this economic report that they have fig- figured out certain lines that then fit with their narrative. Uh, but I'm convinced that the NDP is like a, a Christmas package under the under the Christmas tree where it's a very big box and it's very shiny and it's professionally wrapped and has a nice little bow on it. But on the inside is actually a pair of socks. Like if there's That's just nothing in there. Nobody wants socks for Christmas. <laughs> right. Where it's, just, it's very disappointing in when you actually open it up and go through it, um, will they actually have the execution ability to to um, make this happen? It all sounds very nice right now. Um, and again, it's timely before, right before an election in an election year. Uh, but will, will it actually work? Who knows? I mean, these things are going to take some time to build um, and, and I have a whole rant about the BC construction industry as well on that, but I'll allow some others to speak first. You're si- so let's say you're in government and you're sitting on this report that shows you that whatever you have just done is going to lower prices 6 to 12 percent. It's so tempting to use it. How heavy do you go on it knowing that it's such a specific set of numbers that you may not even be able to achieve due to circumstances outside of your control? Do you do you pause from going fully in on embracing that in the messaging, knowing that you might not hit it? Well, I think we're going to see an evolution of the reduction of any sort of, uh, sorry, the elimination of any sort of statistical figure on it, uh, rather just focusing on the fact that they're going to lower the cost of housing. Uh, that going into any election platform uh, in a nice campaign slogan, that that's going to be appealing to most uh, because no one will actually be able to fact check uh, these stats uh, in a way that's uh, really um, comprehensive. I mean, no one has time for that. Uh, so they'll probably just eliminate all of the stats altogether. Yeah, yep. no one even understands. Like, I've read the modeling report, it's 201 pages. I don't even understand most of it. Uh, it's very detailed economic kind of assumptions, Jillian. Yet that number that jumps out, that idea, and the NDP have phrased it as, not so much as Ali was pointing out the number, but the idea it stabilizes the housing market seems to be how they want to phrase this modeling report. Their changes will stabilize housing. What do you make of that? Yeah, that's right. It kind of enables them to say that they've been successful either way, because even if prices go up, they can say, oh, but that would have been a lot worse had we not done this. Um, I think, you know, the housing minister fumbled this a little bit. They clearly had the report when they were debating the legislation um, two weeks ago, but didn't release it. He said that it was going to be an outright um, 
price decrease, um, which turned out to not be true. I think, you know, now he's on record saying that it's probably not going to come to fruition. I, I, I think, though, they still got the headline they wanted, which is that big, shiny, you know, over 200,000 new homes build. And I think that there's a really broad sense from the public that that is really needed. And that's a good thing. Um, other interesting aspects from this report, um, the infrastructure is going to be the, the new big barrier to actually getting this done. We saw that raised from a lot of municipalities. Um, so that's kind of where the government needs to go next. Um, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, this was a, a useful political tool for them to have sort of a second week of positive coverage over the initiative. Jeff, what do you think? There is that point and uh, others have raised it. Jillian just raised it there that all this stuff was clearly done um, and available for the NDP when it went to pass its legislation last week. Um, but it claimed at the time that it was going to develop those regulations and come up with that modeling in the future. Seven days later, the future has arrived, the glorious distant future. Uh, does anyone care about that? And what do you make of the numbers? Maybe, maybe folks care about it. Uh, but if you're a government or you're anyone that has uh, rules, regulations that will have an impact on uh, people's, people's pocketbooks and, and markets, you got to be really circumspect before you go out and put put numbers out there. So I think that's what they were um, what they were doing. We did put uh, the, he did put a number out. It was it was yeah. 14 and this number is less. But anyways, yeah, well, uh, I, I did want to talk about that box under uh, Ali's Christmas tree. And there is a glorious Christmas tree that that Ali uh, has. I don't think it sucks. I think it's a sledgehammer and power tools. I think he's taking a sledgehammer to years of inaction on housing. He's going to get some 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 stuff built. I think the numbers here aren't what is going to drive the vote. It's the action that's going to drive the vote. And so if I'm doing really pain gift metaphors here, uh, let's say it's not a sledgehammer in the box. Let's say it's a sweater in the box. That's the gift. That's what everyone wants. The nice cozy sweater that makes them feel good. That's the action that they're taking on, on, on housing. That's the multi-residential uh, uh, units. That's the transit oriented development and all the other stuff. Uh, these numbers around more supply, 293,000 up to that many units at a stabilized pricing around 9% less than it would have been. That's like uh, when you're, you bought the sweater and the, the person at the store says, that sweater looks good on you. You totally made the right choice getting behind, getting that sweater. It's, it, 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 it's, it's the numbers themselves are not going to move thing, but they're going to support uh, government getting support based on the actions that it's taken. Mm. The stuff I buy at the store never quite looks as good when I get it home, but maybe that's just the lighting. So I'm not sure how far we can carry this gift metaphor before it doesn't apply <laughs> at all to anything we're talking about. But, uh, it's good. I like it. Let's go around again because I want to I want to talk about a couple other things that this modeling report talks about that we have talked about on the show before, and that is a couple things that Adam Olson was saying when he was debating this bill and that the housing minister, Ravi Kailan, either refused to admit or kind of danced around. And that is quadrupling the density on single family lots is going to increase the value of single family lots. Makes sense. Government said it wasn't going to happen in the modeling report. It says, yeah, I mean, they're going to become more scarce and they're going to be um, redeveloped into multiplexes. So there's that, right? That raises the issue of what is this legislation going to do? It's going to make people who are wealthy, who own single family homes, already wealthy, wealthier uh, to build things that hopefully are going to be more affordable than they currently are on, on that lot. So does that circle square in your mind? Jillian, I want to go back to you because we talked about this and Adam Olson had brought it up. Is, is it a validation of a larger concern of, that, um, that the Green MLA had or is that the only way to affect change in housing? You got to help no one's going to do anything unless they make money. So you got to help the rich get richer to help the people who can't afford maybe get a slice of that. I, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think if you're going to be relying on the private sector, on private developers, there has to be a profit incentive in order for them to to build these units. Um, so there isn't a way around it unless you're sort of going to be taking on more responsibility for the actual building and development as government, which is a huge um, undertaking. Um, we might see some of that coming next year in the upcoming BC build strategy that we're still waiting for details on. Um, 
more public build out of affordable housing, which I think is is really where we need to go um, in order to actually see affordable housing. Because again, I think what we're sort of talking about here is is more units and maybe yes, the the duplexes and townhouses that are going to come out of this might be a little bit less expensive relative to a single family home. But on the other hand, you know, you don't have an income suite in there. So if they're over a million in particular, are these still um, reasonable houses for the average family to afford? Probably not. I think, you know, um, the ship has sailed on that a long time ago, unless we're talking about a, a pretty significant decrease. Um, and, you know, even the total amount that this is going to bring in the uh, 200,000, 250,000 about um, is, is less, far less than the CMHC says that we need to return affordability to sort of early 2000s levels, which was still, you know, kind of expensive, just that was before the crazy, crazy increases. So I think it's a validation for the Greens. It's something to watch out for. It's going to be interesting to see, um, you know, now that these regulations are out, they come into force before the election, if, assuming we have it in the fall. If we start to see um, some of these price increases on single family homes, I think that could potentially be a bit of a political liability he heading into the election, um, especially because the government's kind of been out there saying that they're going to see a decrease and then we're probably going to see an increase, at least at the outset once these units start to get bought up and redeveloped um so you know i think it's just a question of whether the government can put more additional measures um to truly affordable housing in place to convince the electorate that they're sort of on the right track in the longer term jeff do you think if the dream of of owning a single family home as we as it exists right now one home one lot backyard you know uh if, if that's not in reach for people, but a, one of the quadplexes on that lot or a slightly more affordable apartment is in reach. Is that is that good enough, do you think, politically for, for the NDP to deliver it to the public? Will that, will that be received positively or do people still hold out that dream that somehow all of this is going to mean that they can go buy a house um, that is cheaper than it is now? Yeah, I, uh, I think if you're a uh... If you put yourself in the shoes of, of someone in British Columbia right now, you've just found out that you've got to go find new housing uh, somewhere. Uh, you go on to, to, to Craigslist or you go on to some other service where it's got the, the listings and uh, you're looking for something right now. It, it just it, you go into a pit of despair looking at what's available and what it costs. And if turning one house into four to six uh, uh, helps make it so that when that person goes looking for a place, then there's more options and the prices are maybe a little bit lower because there's more competition, because there's more stuff on the, on the market. But that's what people want and that's where people are, are coming from. This will be a, a, a moderate part. The multiplex part will be a moderate part of the solution. Jillian's absolutely right that there's got to be a public build out on public lands of of uh, publicly financed and delivered uh, housing. And I'm convinced that we'll see movement in that regard and in the budget. I think the transit oriented development is a game changer too, and it's gonna uh, help as well. But at the end of the day, like I, I don't love it that uh, someone's gonna get, uh, uh, who already has wealth is gonna get even richer while all sorts of other folks are, are, are struggling. But politics is the art of the, the possible and you have to make trade-offs. And I think the trade-off here is uh, 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 more wealth for, for those folks in exchange for more housing and more affordable housing for folks who are desperate now is a trade-off that's that I think makes a lot of sense. Ali, just to close off uh, this topic with you, uh, often lost in this discussion is renters. And I think according to the modeling that that indicates that maybe the six to twelve percent might even apply to rents and prevent them from going up or coming down a little bit. Uh, where we are now politically, how big of an influence are renters, and do you think they're getting enough attention in, in the kind of this discussion as we talk about what people can afford to buy in a single family home and a multiplex? And is that an is that an area that's that's missing in in some of this housing legislation as well? I don't think it's necessarily missing. I, I think that all of the changes are going to impact them eventually down the road. So perhaps we're not saying uh, renters specifically right now, uh, but it will it will affect them in the inventory of what's available, um, the, the, the more supply uh, component. Uh, but Rob, you mentioned something about you know uh, 
the, the, the dream of home ownership. And, it, and I think what's important to mention in all of this is that we really have to rethink about uh, what the dream actually is and what the reality is. Uh, and let's just blow it up completely. Like the, the white picket fence, the house with four bedrooms and um, all of the space, you can't, we can no longer have that in the city of Vancouver. Um, the land that we sit on is very valuable uh, and people want to be here and we need to, to attract people here and for, for people to stay here um, that we can't necessarily do that with the zoning that, uh, that exists in Vancouver with a lot of these single family lots. And so uh, when we talk about people getting richer, it's, it's just the luck of the draw here. Uh, and and, um, and we, we, like, we have to essentially change what we want uh, in order for more people to be accommodated in all of, all of this. Let's move on to another topic this week, and that is rampant speculation <laughs> about a possible merger between BC Conservatives and BC United, mainly because we're asking the leaders uh, what they think of that idea. And it's kind of exploded after a new Abacus data poll became the latest in a series of polls showing the Conservatives surging to second place popularity in BC. Some think it's about brand confusion with the federal Conservatives. Uh, but anyways, you have the NDP at, say, 44 points, the Conservatives at 26, way up uh, from the last election in BC United, down at 17, uh, and the Greens at around 6. So Falcon, Kevin Falcon, John Rustad both repeatedly asked, hey, should you, should you join forces to take on the NDP? Um, and now we're all debating if that should happen, will it ever happen? What would be required to make it happen? Uh, is it realistic to sort of uh, talk about this 10 months before the next election? Is it, is it even in the realm of possibility? Uh, Jillian, what do you think of all that? Um, yeah, I mean, it it's, feels like almost every week we're getting a poll that's bad for BC United. It's got to be pretty disheartening to be in their shoes right now. I think, you know, the idea of a merger, um, which would, you know, see a formal merger of the two parties, like we saw with um, Wild Rose and the Conservatives in Alberta, um, that's very difficult to do, considering that Rustad was recently booted from the, the caucus by the current uh, BC United leader. Um, that usually requires a vote by membership. It's a whole process they probably don't have time for in, in uh less than a year. Um, the other option would be some sort of pact where they sort of agree not to run against each other in certain ridings or something like that. Um, to my knowledge, that's never successfully been done in Canada. It's been done a few times in other countries, um, but it's really difficult to coordinate. It would require probably in particular um, incumbent BC United MLAs to step down in, in their ridings, and I just can't see that happening, um, especially given the history and the bad blood between these two parties. Yeah, it'd be a, a massive series of things, like as you point out, that would have to happen to make it a reality. Uh, Jeff, there's also the policy issues, uh, whether it feels like United has tried to chart more of a middle ground to appeal to sort of urban voters. Um, some of the issues for the Conservatives uh, are not maybe necessarily big urban uh, issues. Uh, Falcon's kind of stuck between trying to figure out if he wants to, to bring that back or stay on his path um what do you think of the idea of a merger if that's even possible well uh it it is historically it's happened uh, uh before in british columbia uh but it's not likely to happen at uh, this time and i'll point to the exciting 1945 coalition of liberal and conservatives provincially uh who defeated the cooperative commonwealth uh federation same in 1949. Uh, you may hear the names of uh, john hart and uh, Boss Johnson, former premiers, well, they came to office on a coalition against the CCF. And by the way, it was Boss Johnson who disbanded the BC Police Service and brought in the RCMP. So, uh, Surrey, thank uh, Boss Johnson for what you're going through uh, today. <laughs> um, I, I think that uh, on the issues, you raise the issues. Uh, it, it's it's hard to to see Kevin Falcon and and John Rustad working together on the issues because one of Kevin Falcon's proudest moments was uh, booting John Rustad from caucus on a, a matter of principle because he thought that his views were too extreme on, on, on climate change. And so they could never agree on anything like getting rid of the carbon tax or uh, completely gutting BC's uh, uh, climate regulations or, oh wait, 
wait a second, I'm getting in my, in my headset that Kevin Falcon's been following John Rust has leads on a whole bunch of issues. And it's exactly because- You're of, not even wearing a headset. I, it's, How I, is that possible? I have, I, have, I, have, I have little headphones here. Little headphones oh, here. I got you. Or okay, maybe yeah. I'm yeah. just hearing <laughs> my dogs are talking to me or something. I don't know. But, yeah. you know, there, there's, a, that's, there's this dynamic going on where, you know, like a year ago, it was, uh, we, we can't have this, this fella and his views on our party. It's an albatross. And now it's, well, we're going to lose. So we better adopt all those ideas that we booted out of the party uh, a year ago. I don't think it's good. I, there's all sorts of other reasons that this won't work. And if we go around again, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go through them. But uh, I'll, I'll cede the floor because I've talked too much, yeah. as usual. No, no it's because you don't have the painting behind you. The painting was the calming influence that uh, led you to You can see it. I've got stubble now because the painting's <laughs> gone. I'm not sleeping as well. It's, there you go. It's really difficult. Ali, give us just a minute on this, and then we're going to stay around for podcast extras. We'll talk a bit more about it. But the idea of a merger, even possible, should we be speculating about it? I, I truly don't think that it is possible uh, for the following reason, and that's uh, that the two parties are... Uh, very different now. Um, the BC Conservatives have now kind of figured out their communications lane, their messaging lane, uh, what their brand is, uh, and it. And uh, John Rustad has even gone to say that he won't budge on his pillars of his the values of the BC Conservative Party. Um, so they won't be able to compromise uh, with the BC United in any sort of official merger. Uh, Cooperation is a different strategy, though. Like, could they uh, come together on certain votes very much uh, like the NDP and the Liberals federally? Uh, that's always a possibility. But could they come together as one? Uh, probably not. And, and that's just because they're, they're just too different now, even though that there's, there's overlap, right? We think about the coalition of the federal Liberals, federal Conservatives, there are overlap in people. But uh, I think the BC Conservative Party is heading into a different direction uh, from the BC United. And so I don't think it's actually going to work. It'll just be chaos. Interesting. We'll, we will keep talking about this in the next 10 months, the next election, and all sorts of other things uh, in happening in BC politics. Thank you so much to the panel for being here, and thank you for watching. We'll be back next week with all the latest here on Political Capital.